we operate alongside engineering businesses, okay, and we're the largest and best resource data system partner. So the last time I heard, I think that was within the Northern Europe region. So yeah, we're, we're doing all right. Okay, so the PLM business employs about 64 people with a rough turnover of about 12 million. The engineering consultancy side um, employs about 85 people with a turnover roughly of about 20 million. Okay, so we all technically work all together, but there's two separate sides to the business. We have four offices in the UK, and we also have one based in South Africa in Johannesburg. Okay. So what do we actually do as a PLM consultancy? So we sell software. So the software that we particularly sell are Dasso system products, such as the new 3D experience platform, which some of you may be familiar with. Okay, uh, Katia, so Katia V5, our primary product. Uh, Novia, so our data management, Delmir manufacturing, Simulia, which most of you should be familiar with, uh, joining this webinar, so the simulation tool set to create um, analysis and other sort of like fatigue analysis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Exile, Transcat, Ramses, IMS Post, etc. So that's the software side. Not only do we sell software, we also do consultancy, so we do implementations and project management. So for example, if someone wants to buy 3D experience from us, we we'll would fully take it from them purchasing it, helping them customize it, implementing it, so the server side, the client side, etc. Project managing the rollout and, in, and getting them going with it. So we also do software development, which comes under the customization. And not only that, so once we've implemented it, we can do support as well, support training. So we have an, uh, a really well organized help desk uh, where people can send us questions or any uh, inquiries and we'll get back to them. So we have multiple engineers that man our help desk. Our engineering services, so we have a design consultancy. We can take concept all the way through to detailed design, uh, material and process selection, prototype supply and component testing. We do structural analysis, so ourselves, we are all Abacus CAE users, so I'm going to briefly show you guys throughout this webinar how we can implement these nonlinear materials in Abacus CAE. We use the program, so we know about it. Uh, we do linear, nonlinear testing, thermal analysis, dynamic analysis, etc. And our expertise, so we do press tool design, styling, patent design, research, casting, and um, mold tool design, etc. So it's not like we all specialize in all of these fields and um, there'll be one or two of us that know more about one field than the others but together there's nothing we can't do so let's begin this webinar so this webinar is about nonlinear material so let's start with what is a material it's basically everything around us so a material it could be a laminate such as plywood like a table that you might be resting on while you're listening to this webinar it could be uh, the aluminium can, which you add your um, lunchtime beverage in from, uh, a water bottle, a rubber, which you may use, could be um, some cast components for a vehicle. Basically, the gist of it is materials are all around us. So that's materials, but what exactly is a nonlinear material? So let's, it's the same thing. So all materials in real life are essentially nonlinear. I mean, for example, if you have a chair and you sit on it, it deforms probably linearly. If you sit on it a bit hard, um, let's say we've maybe jumped on it, it might deform non-linearly. So it has non-linear properties to it. Okay. So, for example, when you crush an aluminium coke can, um, it deforms non-linearly, etc. So every material pretty much is non-linear as well. So it's important to understand the theory. If we choose an aluminium can, for example, so this is a typical stress-strain curve on, of an aluminium alloy. Um, other alloys and other materials will vary. Uh, we'll look at other materials later on, moving away from metallic objects. But a lin what linear assumes is, is this part of a stress-strain curve. So it has a linear relationship. So we assume, let's say we have an aluminium can and we're pulling it apart. As we increase the load applied, so the stress, it 
it deforms so it will extend which gives us strain essentially we'll talk about strain in a minute and this has a linear relationship and what we'd assume is linear elastic so as soon as we let go of it it will spring back to its original geometry what happens in real life is obviously if you um, extend it above its limit so you apply enough stress it will deform plastically which is known as non-linearly okay until it reaches so it will reach a yield point and then it will deform to deform non-linearly okay so what we can do sometimes when we have analysis with small deformations uh, where we're expecting small deformations we assume that it's just linear okay so if you're operating in this part of a stress strain curve you can go with a linear analysis I'll, I'll speak about why it's, it might be beneficial to go for a linear analysis rather than nonlinear however if we're likely to apply um, a stress which will result in large def uh, load, sorry, which will resu uh, result in large deformation, and linear analysis is basically going to, um, it's not going to be a realistic representation. Okay, so it's going to be a fairly large approximation. Okay, so we want to start looking at the nonlinear aspect of that material curve. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this strain, stress strain curve is the material spec. So once it deforms plastic uh, elastically within this area, if you let go of the material, it will go back to its original geometry. When it reaches this point, the yield point, that's when it begins deforming plastically. So essentially, that's the point of no return. It's not going to return back to its original shape. And we can analyze what's going on there as well. So you can see the strain as we apply uh, more load, so as the stress increases, it starts leveling out. Okay, so as we reduce the load, the strain gets greater. So again, still stick with linear versus nonlinear. So the basics of an FE analysis is this F equals KU. So the force equals the stiffness matrix um, times the displacement. Okay, so that's how that's how all the results for the FE analysis are computed. Now, for linear analysis, the stiffness matrix stays constant. Okay, so it just gives you as the displacement, well, as the load increases, you can see it will directly reflect the displacement because K would stay the same. However, with a nonlinear analysis, K is very where K is the stiffness matrix. Okay, so what really happens in the analysis where a stiffness matrix is varying with nonlinear analysis, at every time step, it will reanalyze what the stiffness matrix value is. Okay, so it will do its wizardry, all the long mathematics that would, we'd struggle to do by hand, and recalculate K at each time step. Other theories to be aware of. So, there are two types of values. Engineering are also known as nominal, and there's also true. What's the difference between the two? Well, true is experimental and test data, whereas engineering, or nominal, as it's also known, is mathematical formulation. Okay, so one thing to note, which is really important, is, is Abacus uses true values. So all the values that you want to put into your as the material spec must be true values, not engineering. How do you determine if something is engineering or true? Well, let's have a look at that. So we have stress and we have strain. So engineering stress with all the, um, this is just basic engineering, which people, most of you probably be familiar with. Engineering stress is equal to the load applied, so the force divided by area what's the zero it's the initial area okay so for example if I was pulling on my coke can even if I applied more force we'd assume that the cross-sectional area remains the same throughout okay so we just take a naught and that gives us engineering stress engineering strain is equal to the current length so the length of the elongation minus the original length 
divided by the original length, which can be um, cut down to length over original gauge length minus one. Okay, so that's what it's cut down to. So how do we get all these engineering values to true, which is what we need for abacus? So true stress is equal to force, so the load applied, divided by the area. Note the difference where in engineering we had initial area, now we have area. So it's the area of the cross section at that current time. Okay, so obviously as you're pulling on the coat cab, um, the material has to do something in order to compensate for the additional length, so it starts to essentially shrink. So the cross-sectional area is getting smaller, so it will be the area every sort of sample time step, essentially. Then that could also be equal to the engineering stress, so that's engineering stress plus engineering stress times engineering strain. Okay, so it can be um, reduced down to this formulation. So, what about how do you get um, true strain? So the strain is the um, change. So that's equal to the log of the, the length at that current point divided by the original length. Okay, or it could be the log of engineering strain plus one. Okay, so that's another way of getting engineer, true engineer, uh, true strain. Sorry. So it's often enough easy enough to calculate engineering values, but it not might not be practical enough to calculate um, true. Well, it might not be pr practical enough to obtain true values. So if you use these equations, you can go from engineering values to true values. Okay, so this is what we need to put into Abacus. It's really important that we remember that the true values. So what are some advantages and disadvantages of using nonlinear materials? So let's have a look at the advantages. So the advantages is it's more representative of real life. Okay, so for example, if you have our aluminium can, and we could probably all relate to this, if I was to pull on it, if I've got enough grip, we'll probably run out of grip first, but if I was to pull on it enough, elongate it to a point, if is it representative of real life, if I did a linear analysis and it managed to deform by, let's say, one meter, it's a bit of a over-exaggeration, but it's not. If you were to pull on the coat cam by one meter, if you let go of it, would it spring back to its original geometry? No, it won't. So that's if I just go back a couple of slides. A linear analysis will just approximate that we just carry on along this curve of a stress-strain curve. What would really happen if we also deform it by one, one meter, we'll pass yielding point and carry on along the plastic region. Obviously with one meter we'll probably reach fracture way before then, but yeah, you get the idea. So it's non-linear materials are more representative of real life. It's, o it's the only real way to analyze hyperelastic materials for a representative comparison as well. So if you had like rubber materials, um, a linear elastic, linear elastic property isn't enough. Okay, so we have to have, add hyperelastic materials. Okay, so generally with large deformations, it will spring back to its original shape. So for example, elastic bounds a good one in this case. You could add probably um, 100 mil of deformation to it on a large elastic band, let go of it, it will spring back. Whereas if you added 100 mil of deformation to 100 mil yep, of like a aluminium or some sort of metallic metal, it's not going to spring back to its original shape. Okay, so hyperelastic materials, we have to use non-linear materials. Also for high-speed dynamic analysis. So if I was to apply high-speed loading, such as a crash scenario, a car going into a wall. Um, Linear analysis isn't linear material properties isn't enough. Okay, so it will start deforming um, non-linear, non-linearly. So a linear static analysis using elastic material properties assumes a nice steady um, ap application of load. Okay, it doesn't, it won't assume that there's a high speed load applied 
it just assumes as a steady, steady load applied. Disadvantages, of course. Obviously, the more we expect from our analysis, we get increased computation time. Okay. What we generally say when you want to run a nonlinear analysis with nonlinear properties is run a linear analysis because it's a lot quicker. You want to ensure that there's no sort of added complications to the model. It runs, it completes, and then you can switch to a nonlinear analysis. So you don't want to be waiting a long time for the analysis to finish just to find out it's not going to finish because there's a problem with it, there's an error somewhere. So it's always better to do the quicker analysis, the linear analysis, to make sure that it will run. There's obviously more increased complexity involved, so there's more likeliness for errors. Okay, so that's another disadvantage. Also, it's less stable, so that's why I mean it's better to do a linear analysis to make sure everything runs first. Okay. So that's just due to the more complexity, the increased complexity of the uh, mathematics involved. Okay. If we go back, directly related to K changing, so the stiffness matrix varying. So the next question is, so we've learned what a nonlinear material is, which is everything, but when do you use material nonlinearity? It's basically when yielding is likely to occur. So as I mentioned, if we have our Coke can, nice simple example, we're pulling it apart. If you're likely to pull it and have a enforced displacement of, let's say, 100 millimeters, it's very likely to yield. So you do need to have a bit of knowledge of what you're doing, a bit of engineering cap on your head to understand how these materials are likely to behave. And that's when you determine when to use material nonlinearity, so when the yielding is likely. For large dis deformations, displacements are the same thing. The reason we say for large deformations and displacements is because the linear part is likely to only, for metals anyway, is likely to only be part of a linear part of the stress strain curve. You may go for thin parts which may undergo large stretching. When I say large stretching, again, it will be related to large deformations. And high speed loading, such as crash, or when you use hyperelastic plastic materials, okay, so polymers, um, rubbers, etc. So that's when you want to use material nonlinearity. So the next question do we ask well, do they all behave the same? No. Material nonlinearity differ between material types. So we're generalizing here from metallic to hyperelastic to polymer. So just take this as a pinch of salt. But polymer mater materials, hyperelastic, metallic, you can see these are basically the stress strain curves of a generalized polymer, generalized hyperelastic material, generalized metallic material. You can see they all behave differently. Okay, so with the same load applied, the strain will vary. Okay, how plus how the plus um, how where the plastic plastic modes reach differs um, varies as well. So how do we define all these materials in abacus? CA? Okay, so abacus is one of the familiar applications. So um, how do we apply it in CAE itself? So the fundamentals is we generally always want to specify density if we have dynamic materials. So we want to do a dynamic analysis. Okay, so what we would do, if I show you in Abacus. So here I've got a nice new Abacus 2016. Okay, so most of you haven't seen it. You can see it looks a bit nicer, but generally Anyone that's used any older releases can get on with it very well because it's identical. But to add a material, there's essentially two ways. So easiest way, go to your model tree, right-click on material, create. Or if we're in another module, switch to the property module, click create material, and then we can define a material. Now, Abacus doesn't actually come with a material library, if some of you are wondering. We can't just go and pick a material. The reason for that is, is because the team at Simulia wants to ensure that you have the correct material properties assigned to the analysis. The problem is, if you apply the wrong material properties to your analysis, your results are going to be wrong. Okay, so it's, 
it's highly dependent on the material properties being correct in order to get a representative result of real life testing. So here's my material, give it a name, but under all of these you can apply different options. So general, you've got density, and you can set the density. The other thing to be very important of, which I haven't stressed in this presentation, is to ensure that the units are consistent. So most of you must be aware that Abacus CAE is unitless. It doesn't ask you what units you're working in. It all depends on what units you use. So make sure you are consistent with your units. Okay, same applies with materials as it applies with loads, etc. So we also, for fundamentally, want to add elastic properties or hyperelastic properties if it's rubber, etc., for the material as well. So we always need to have an elastic property of the material. Even if we're applying material non-linearity, we need to ensure there's elastic properties of that material. So that's under mechanical, elasticity, elastic. We'll come back and look at hyperelastic in a minute. And then we can say what type of material it is, set the Young's modulus, and the Poisson's ratio. So that's the fundamentals of it. Now, what if we want to add material nonlinearity? So we then go to the plasticity um, submenu. And we can select plastic. So there's various other options here. We're just going to explore plastic throughout this webinar. And we can select plastic. This now allows us to add yield stress and plastic strain. Okay. And it's not just like, if I just go back a slide, elastic properties where you add a Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. You need to specify generally more than one field to get a decent result. And let me explain why in the next slide. Also, when you're doing multiple results, you can read from a file. So here's one I've done earlier. Let's create a material, mechanical plasticity, plastic. Now, rather than add multiple fields, so add a new insert row before or after and just keep adding lines, if I right click, I can do read from file, select the file I want to read from. Okay, let's just browse to my desktop. Okay, and here's my plastic strain text file. Okay, and it will populate a table for you. Just so some of you are aware of what this notepad file looks like, let's have a look. There we go. I've got one column which represents the yield stress, so remember to be consistent with your units, and another column which represents the strain. Okay, and they're separated with you comma or tab. So here I've used the tab function to separate the columns. Okay. okay, and there's that material stored in the tree. So here, which is important, it says plastic strain. So what does that mean? Well, if we revisit our uh, stress strain curve, we can work out the Young's modulus, which is basically um, the linear portion of the graph of a stress strain curve, um, and you can just do stress over strain, and you've got your Young's modulus. Okay. Then we have a point where there's plus when it uh, reaches ductility, so um, where it starts deforming plastically, essentially, where it's no longer elastic. Now at that point, we have a strain. So at all of these points, we have strain, which is the value along the x-axis. We have stress along the Y. At the, where I first labeled engineering strain, we have a stress value. Okay. Now at this point where it starts deforming plastically, we get a strain at the yield stress. So there's a yield stress and then there's strain. Now if we carry on going, so if we assume um, material linearity, and have a look at the true data, so the plastic deformation. The plastic strain is actually only the strain between the linear uh, gradient and the actual plastic uh, graph. So 
essentially there will be a total strain which will be applied at a plastic point. So let's say at um, yield stress 0.2, there's a total strain. Plastic strain will be total strain minus elastic strain. So E here stands for elastic, not engineering. Okay. So it's important that we understand this. The plastic strain is only that part of the graph. Okay, so if you don't obviously have that part, just increase, just assume the linear part of the graph continues and work out the plastic strain. Okay, so it's, it's equal to total strain minus elastic strain, which will then give us plastic strain. Okay, and that's what we put in this column. The yield stress is just the value at which you read that value of, so the stress at that point. So as I mentioned, you're going to get quite a lot of data. The more data you have, the better it is. The reason why I say the more data, the better, is because it's going to more, uh, rep more likely represent this part of the graph. So if you only had two nodes, you might have a point here and a point there. It's just going to represent it with essentially a straight line. So the more points you have, the more accurate uh, that material spec can be. Okay? So you're essentially, these are just plotting points of material plasticity. So again, as I mentioned, just right click in the table, read from file, pick the text file which looks something like this, and it will populate the data. It's important to note there's no link, it just reads the file one way, it doesn't, read, it doesn't write to it. So if you change the data, it won't update the text file. Now, hyperelastic materials. So again, defined under elasticity, hyperelastic, Okay, so it's called hyperelastic because they can deform quite largely and spring back into their original form. So they're elastic, hyperelastic. You can choose a material type again. And then you have a strain energy potential. Okay, so there's various different types under there. So let's have a look at that in Abacus. So creating material, mechanical, elasticity, hyperelastic. You can see the strain energy potential has various different types. So the most common one that's generally used is Mooney uh, Rivlin. Okay. Now, how do I find out more information about which one to use? So generally, that's the one that's used. But if you go to the help of Abacus, and to save me a bit of time, I've searched for it beforehand. Abacus CA user guide. Create and analyze in a model using Abacus CAE, um, a property module, defining mechanical material models, defining elasticity. We can see it tells us about each section. So, creating isotropic material, then have I lost it again? Um, yeah, here we go. So, basically, chapter 12.9.1. Okay, the Mooney Rivlin, and here we go. It tells us what the va what unit or not the unit, sorry, uh, what formulation is required, um, and what we need to input. So again, if I go back to the slide, this is just a snippet of the um, of the help itself. So you can find out more information there. <coughs> So you can see in this particular instance where we choose Mooney Revlin and we choose coefficients, we're asked to enter these three values, so C10, CO1, and D1. Okay, so what are they? Okay, so again, it says in the help. Okay, so it's just strain energy per unit of reference volumes. Okay, and C10, CO1, and D1 are temperature dependent material parameters. Generally, it's going to be fairly hard to capture this information. So what you can do, it's a little trick in Abacus, and generally what you would do, you would obtain from the material supplier, so I'll just go back a couple of slides, the stress strain curve essentially of that hyperelastic material, which will essentially form this curve. Now, I've been given it in both uniaxial and biaxial test data. The more you add, the more representative of the material it is. Okay, so I'm going to change from coefficients to test data. Okay, so the test data I have, I'll go back to this folder, I have biaxial, 
and uniaxial data okay, of my hyperelastic material. So basically the nominal stress and the nominal strain. So if I go into Abacus, I'm going to change this to test data, test data, uniaxial test data, and I can input this um, one by one or read from a file. So read from a file, and that's uniaxial. Let me just leave that as uniac, so I just want to show you something. So let's just do OK. Now we can actually view that material from the tree, so we've got materials. The first one, which is plastic, that's not the one we're interested in, we're interested in the second one, the hyperelastic material. I can right click on it, go to evaluate, check those settings, OK. Wait a little bit of time while it calculates the material spec. Okay, so currently it says unstable for all strains. You can see it's calculating my D1, my C10, and my C01 values. If I just close that, you can also see it's created the stress strain curve of the material spec. Okay, so it doesn't really look like a hyperelastic material at this point, but Let's just go back and add biaxial test data. Okay, read from file, biaxial. Okay, so it's read all the values. Okay, okay, and now let's have a look at that again. So evaluate. Okay, again, you can um, have a look at these values as well. If you want to change the plot, you can specify min and max strains, etc. Okay. So again, it calculates D1, C10, and C01, and it's still showing me the old plot, only a second. Let's just create a third material. Okay, hyperelastic, Rooney Rivlin test data, okay, the uniaxial data, read from file uniaxial and biaxial test data. Read from file and there's biaxial. Whoops. So it's important as well to select in the right column as well. You can see it start populating uh, offset by one column. Let's just make sure it's selected the right one. Biaxial. Okay. Um, let's evaluate that. Okay, so now you can see it's stable. Got your D1, it's um, recalculated C10 and C01. There you go, you can see basically the stress strain curve of that hyperelastic material. Okay, and you could see the test data, which is in red essentially. Okay, you've got the test data, and then you've got other sort of um, ways it fits that curve. So you can see you've got blue, the green, and the yellow, and you can see probably the best fit is essentially the yellow. Okay, so if I just Increase that text, increase that font size. So it's basically the origin and free uniac material. That's the way it's calculated it. So that's the best fit. Okay, so yeah, that's the graph that you'd essentially get. Another thing to essentially remember when you do this. Um, when you run a non use a nonlinear material is to ensure that you turn on nonlinear geometry as well. Okay, so that's defined when you define a step. So if you go into your step, you want to essentially assure that nonlinear geometry is turned on. So if we was to create a step for example, let's create a second step, general static. You can turn nonlinear geometry on. Okay, so just remember to turn that on as well. So, 
And that basically concludes this short webinar, which is a basic introduction to nonlinear materials. Uh, I hope it was clear why you would use nonlinear materials over um, when you would have to use linear material properties. Okay, so the main difference is, is you determine if material um, plasticity is going to occur in your analysis, and that's when you'd have to use nonlinear material properties. So what can you do next? So if you'd like to learn more, not only about nonlinear materials, but other parts of Abacus or any of any of the products that we sell, you can visit our blog. So that's at www.intrinsis.com forward slash blog. If you want to become more proficient with any of the software, maybe you want to specialize in one particular area of the software, you could, you could um, inquire about our training. So again, www.intrinsis.com forward slash training. Or if you'd just like to get in touch, you can get in touch with us by contacting us on the, using the form on www.intrinsis.com forward slash contact. Other ways to stay informed, maybe you'd like to follow us on Twitter, um, review, view us on LinkedIn, YouTube, and we also have a Facebook page, so maybe you'd like to visit us on that. So thank you guys for listening. Um, we still have a few more minutes, so if you would like to ask any questions, feel free to do so throughout the panel. Um, if there are any particular questions I'm unable to answer, I will we'll take them away and we'll answer them in the future, and, well, in the near future. Okay. So please, guys, if you have any questions, ask them um, using the questions in the Citrix webinar box. I'll just give it a couple more minutes, but for those of you that don't have any questions, um, this is basically the end of the webinar. I thank you for um, taking the time to listen to this webinar. I hope you've learned a thing or two, and I hope you will um, join any of our future webinars as well. Okay, guys, there doesn't appear to be any questions. So if you do find you do have questions in the future, um, remember you can contact us through www.intrinsis.com forward slash contact. If you just mention you have a question related to this webinar, something pops up and we'll be happy that will get sent to me and we'll be happy to answer any questions. The other way you can get in contact is by emailing support at intrinsis.com or helpdesk at intrinsis.com. So we'll be happy to take any questions in the future related to this webinar. And we'll be happy to help where we can and answer any of your questions. But thank you for listening and have a lovely day.